Hey, weirdos. I'm Ash. And I'm Elena. And this right here that you're listening to (laughs) is morbid. It sure is. Yeah. It sure is. It remains to be so. Whoa, that was poetry. I am poetry. You are poetry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, you know what you are? You're prose. I'm prose. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love the word prose. I do too. Prose was a sponsor of ours one time. It's been, yeah, it's been a sponsor of ours. Yeah. <laughs> prose. I, I like prose. <laughs> You this know? isn't. This is not an ad for. I was going to say the word prose has no meaning anymore, but it's fun while it lasted. Prose, prose, guys. It's only Tuesday, and we're losing our GD minds. Yeah, you ever I'm have like, a week like that? It's been quite, quite a week. It's just you know that we're it's 2023, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I was like, oh, it's going to be such a great year because I'm getting married that year. <laughs> That's probably the only good thing that will take place. But, but you know what? We're having a positive attitude oh. because we have a po- we have positive candles and lots of statues. Yeah, Mikey really like positive vibe to this place up. The joy candle is wild and over there. Yeah, we have like a positive energy candle, and she is lit right now, and she's also lit. Like she's like she's we lit her, and then she got she lit, lit herself. Like she is really going off right now, which makes me think. That she's like, hey, bitches, <gasps> she would stop never. talking so negatively. I am positive energy. Hear me roar. I and she's feel it. engulfing this room in flames. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and I have some intention flowers sitting next to me. Yeah. I have a whole shelf that Mikey put together for me. So it's positive vibes only. Okay. Positive vibes only. Even when there's tons of shit happening around us that is not great. So I was going to like we're start here. <laughs> making an acronym of everything you said, but then you really just kept going and I lost the letters. <laughs> but I was like, PVO. Oh, oh, wait, she's doing more. P V O W T B. Oh, she, I said, B? did I say shitty yeah. or bad? Okay. You said shitty. Of course you said shitty. T H A U. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You know, that's what everybody's motto should be. So anyway. What is it again? Say it again. Yep, there's your motto. That's your affirmation for today. But positive vibes only here. And you guys rule. I was talking to uh, a listener today. You were? Yes, I was because uh, her name is Danny and she's awesome. I really like her. Is she a phantom? She's a fan too. There you go. I, I don't know. That. I'll ask. I love that show. the reason that I was chatting briefly with her was I think in one of the recent episodes we were talking about how, um, we're, oh, we were talking about it with JVN. We were talking about how we put butter on Pop-Tarts. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and I was like, is that gross, everybody? But no, she was like, I do that too. And then she was like, also don't judge me, but I put butter with my peanut butter I on toast. I do that too, and so do you. And she said, I put butter on saltines. And I was like- Bitch, are we the same person? Because I was like, wait a second. See, that's spooky. That is because that that's shit. Spooky. That shit. Also, that's spooky is a great podcast. Go listen to hey. it. But <laughs> that shit is spooky. I thought that's stuff that whenever I do it, everyone around me is like, that's really gross. And like, you should check yourself before you wreck yourself. And so, yeah. To hear somebody sit there and just out with it, say, like, I also do these two. Very niche things. Do you think that putting butter on before peanut butter is niche? I feel like it is because everyone I've ever mentioned it to is like, that's really gross. I like, wonder John's if I got it horrified. from you. I must have gotten it from you. You did because like, Ma, you did. I think I got it from dad. <laughs> and probably. then I probably passed it to you because I was like, try this. It's fucking good. Because John is horrified by it. Every time I do it, he's like, you are something else. No, everybody should give it a shot. <laughs> Where I do draw the line, though, is butter on saltines. Have you tried it, though? No. Have but... you tried it? You haven't tried it. I'm going to have you try it. And you're going to go. I probably will. I love a good, good. I love a good dipping. Because like, you're not like smearing butter on it. It's just like a light little. A dab will do ya. On it. And you just take it just. With the salt, I don't know what, it just like gives it a little, a little sweet, a little salty. Just, I, just enough, not too much. I might That's have made all. this confession before about saltines on this podcast, but if I haven't, get ready for a fucking wild one. This is Are disgusting. Are you one of those wild people? Um, not anymore, no. 
Um, am I like, no. But when I <laughs> no. was little, this is like a gross fucking <laughs> nasty thing that I did when I was little. I didn't require supervision. Well, I did require <laughs> you required it, but I didn't it. get you it. just didn't get it. I used to dip my saltines into water and eat them. And sometimes, this is so gross, we used to live with this lady named Judy, me and my mom, and she was, Judy, was the best. But, like, she ran a daycare, so there was a lot of us to keep track of. So, you know, maybe I wasn't always getting the eyes on me. I used to dip my saltines into the pool and eat them. Oh, how fucking (laughs) gross is that? Mikey's head just whipped over your like, I would like to tell you that I was, like, seven. How old were you? No, no, no. I would like oh, to tell you Oh, I thought you were saying today, I would like to like, say that I was I seven. Well, I confess that I was, I was actually 17 It was something. actually last week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm actually about to do it now. No, but I, I'm actually <laughs> going to go find the nearest pool and a bag of saltines and have myself a good time. Have myself a day. <laughs> Whoa! Have myself an afternoon. Isn't that so foul? Uh, like that's foul. And it wasn't even a saltwater pool because, like, yeah. no. That's like, one of those things that, like... I'm always of the mind, like, have you tried it? <laughs> but you, you know what? You should not try dipping I feel like that's one of those things that I can say <laughs> is not, not great. Yeah. I also wrote my name on the wall at Judy's house because I had recently seen Madeline do that in her movie. But fun fact, you get in trouble for writing on Judy's walls. <laughs> in case you were thinking of writing on Judy's walls, You get in trouble. You will get in trouble. And gymnastics will get taken away from you. Aw. I know. Don't take after school activities away. Never. It's important. Yeah. I don't know. That's just me. I'm not telling you how to parent. <laughs> but whatever. So what did these fuckers do next? So I think we should. Yeah. So, but you know what? Shout out to Danny for being the same person that I am. Like, what's up, soul sister? Danny, did uh, you dip your saltines <laughs> in the pool? Because we could also be friends. <laughs> we could also be soul <laughs> sisters. <laughs> she's like, girl. She's step like, back. no. <laughs> the she's line like, has been drawn. She said, I don't identify with you. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that was funny. So that was a nice like little like, I, it's a nice moment to like connect for a second yeah. and be like, girl, yeah. Uh, but now we're going to get into some terrible shit. We're going to get into part two of Burke and Hare. Um, these fuckers suck. I know. And that's the thing. Whenever you say like, <laughs> oh, we're going to talk about Burke and Hare, it sounds like a fun story. It sounds whimsical. It sounds like a fairy tale. Like it does sound like a fairy tale. I don't know why I said it that <laughs> way. <laughs> it sounds so fairy like. <laughs> Far, far like it's, it was a soul. So it does sound whimsical. It does. I agree with you. Um, but when we last left them, they murdered a grandma and her grandson separately, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And all four seem to have involvement. Yeah. And then Doctor Knox there was like, "Oh, weird that you brought in an old lady and her grandson at the same time. They don't look as good, so I'm going to give you a little less money for it." And it's like, my guy. He knew. My dude. Like, I'm I'm on the record right now. Yeah. He knew. Oh, he... Are you, you're you not getting all these body, body, oddy, oddy, oddies <laughs> and not questioning it. They just rolled in there right. with a woman and her grandson. And you're telling me that you didn't question that these two people died side by side? Right. And they had already been sus as fuck before. Yeah. Because of the last woman before Mary. they killed the... Yeah. They knew she was known in town. Yeah. They were the last people seen with her. Mm-hmm. Yadi da do. Yadi da do. Like, so, fuck this. Yeah, it's not great. But, you know, the last one that they had before we stopped part one was Effie, who they believed her name was Effie. Right. They, and in their confessions, they were like, I think she went by Effie. It's oh, like, nice. that's nice. Also, I think that's the cutest name. I didn't Effie, get a chance to say it, it is last very week. adorable. Yeah. It's, that's a whimsical name. Oh, totally. Effie. I follow this girl, sorry, on TikTok that um, she will categorize names and she does them into like whimsical names, like old Mm. fashioned names. That's fun. I'm going to find her name later and tell you. Yeah. I want to know what my name would be categorized into. Well, so she does like baby names. So I've actually never seen your name on there. Oh. She does like, um, like if My name was a baby name at one point. No way. Yeah. It was? Yeah. <laughs> I never seen you on there. You're not whimsical. You're no. not old fashioned. At one point it was a baby name. One day. Because I was a baby at one point. But you were a cute little baby. <laughs> little I wasn't baby. there to like witness it in person. Because like see photographic evidence. Maybe I was in a different life. One of your souls probably was. Probably. I think that. Anyway. But either way, poor Effie. She was a hawker. She was actually known around town. She was known to Burke. Of course she was. So she, and and when I last told you guys, she had gone door to door kind of selling, and I think she was going to sell him bits of leather for his cobbling work. Okay. And he enticed her into a barn with alcohol and the promise of rest. Once she had fallen asleep, 
He said he laid a cloth over her and suffocated her as they did the others. Oh, okay. Then they just brought her to Knox's dissection room and got 10 shillings for the body. Wow. Yep. So as the summer went on, the stress of maintaining this whole thing was beginning to wear a little bit on Burke and Hare. Not in the sense of them having remorse or guilt, but just in the sense of stress of doing it. Yeah. And trying to maintain the whole thing. And it was also, you know, it was wearing on their significant others as well. So Laird, like we talked about, had been at least like on like outsidely involved in the murder. She was definitely there. Yeah. And participating they were in her, her in some boarding way. house, right? Yeah. And she was participating in some way, luring people in, you know, mm-hmm. help plying them with alcohol. Yeah. Helen McDougal, like we said, she had not actively involved herself in any of the killings up to this point. Except the grandson. The grandson, she didn't actively involve herself in his killing. She was only there to calm him down when he couldn't find his grandma. Oh, okay. So if we're talking, sp- like, specifically, yeah, was she involved in a killing? We have no evidence of that right now. Okay. That is, but to you're me... you're about to tell me something. That, to me, is accomplish it right there. Like, you were Hell calming yeah. down this kid... Yeah. When did you know what was happening to his grandma or did you not? I mean, I feel like this is a small fucking boarding house. That's like, what I think. But, you know. I don't know. But she, so she hadn't actively involved herself in any of the killings, like I said. And she's with Burke, just to lay that out first. Yes. So Hare actually ended up think, looking at that as a liability because she hadn't actively involved herself in any of the crimes, but she was around And knew what was going on, it seems like. Yeah. Which, it's one of those things where it's like, if you're going to be around, you better make one of the stab wounds so that we can all point to you and say, you did it too. Yeah. Otherwise, you can just go, I didn't do anything, but here's all the information. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be implicated at all. That's how he was looking at it. Exactly. He was like, the fact that the three of us have been actively involved in these and she isn't but is around, that's a problem. Yeah. So, in fact, at one point, Hare had gone so far as to suggest that Burke kill the woman um, his, in order to protect wife? themselves. The fuck? Yeah. Hey, I think you should um, off your wife because she hasn't murdered with yeah. us yet. He even came up with a plan how to do it. He wanted Burke to take her into the country for a few weeks, then write Hare and inform him of McDougal's death. And, of course, in reality, the murder would have been committed in the back room of the boarding house... And with McDougal's corpse being just another one of the bodies that they gave to Dr. Knox. It's, hey, it's wild. My wife died. Here she is. Isn't that so wild? So crazy that, like, I've been getting all these bodies for you and now my wife died. So when they, and he was trying to have him set up an alibi. Yeah. Like, he was trying to set this whole thing up. He had really thought about this, which is scary. If I was Burke, right? Which yeah, one is? Burke is with McDougal. Yeah. If I was Burke, I'd be worried that hair was going to kill my lady. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean... I guess fortunately for Helen McDougal, Burke may have been an opportunistic monster. Yeah. Like an actual piece of shit. But I guess his one line was that he wouldn't readily murder the woman that he claimed to love, I suppose. So they did not go forward with that plan. Everyone's got a line. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to give him anything. But I'm like, not at giving least, him anything, no. At least he didn't do that, I guess. Yeah. Um, so... If Air, I think this kind of shows, like, the eagerness with which Hare wanted to dispatch Helen McDougal, that's kind of evidence of the growing tension, not only between the whole group, but between Burke and Hare specifically. Mm-hmm. So then the next murder really didn't do anything to relieve Burke's suspicions of Hare. Like, this made things worse. So in early summer, Burke estimated it, estimated it like late June, which was around the anniversary anniversary. Of the Battle of Bannockburn, which I just thought was interesting, the name Bannockburn. I like that. Uh, Burke and McDougal had left Edinburgh for a, pre- a brief period of time just to visit friends in Falkirk. Okay. During this time, Hare and Laird were having a lot of financial difficulties and had ended up pawning everything they owned that was of value. Oh, everything? Yeah. Uh, anything that was of value they were pawning. Yet when Burke and McDougal returned a short time later... Suddenly, Hare and Laird appeared to no longer have any financial troubles. Interesting. So when Burke asked Hare if he'd been 
quote unquote doing any business mm. you know what that means do we i love that he's like doing, doing any, any business. business like these two are fucking business partners yeah. are you kidding were me were you doing business when i wasn't here wow so he asked him were you doing any business while i was away with helen Hare denied it said no However, in discussion with Dr. Knox, Burke learned that during their absence, Hare had, quote, fell in with a drunk woman in the street in the Westport and enticed her back to the boarding house, killed her, and sold the body to Knox and kept the money for himself and then lied about it. What? Which I'm like, wow, you guys are shitbag monsters. And now you're even being shitbag monsters to each other. Yeah, I mean, it was only a matter of time. It was. Like, you're not... What you think you have a friend? Yeah, like you're like, both sociopaths. That's you don't the thing. Have a like neither one of you gives a shit about anybody. Right. So for some reason, Burke and Hare started getting pretty reckless as the summer was drawing to an end. I'm not sure why. They just started getting very reckless. The heat. <laughs> it's the heat, you know. Um, one night, the two spotted a policeman by the name of Andrew Williamson, and he was dragging a very obviously drunk woman to the Westport Watch House. So Burke saw this and called out, let that woman go, to, go on to her lodgings. And the police officer, Williamson, said he didn't know where the woman lived. That's why he was taking her to the watch house to keep her from spending the night on the street. Yeah. So he's after, like, I'm a good person. Like, I'm actually trying to do a good thing here, but right. cool. So after like a brief conversation, Burke was actually able to convince the officer to release her to him. She was brought back to the boarding house and she was murdered and sold to Knox for 10 shillings. If you don't tell me that this is how they got caught, I am leaving the room. According to Burke, he, quote, had a good character with police, which is why he was able to convince that police officer to release the very obviously drunk woman to him that night. But this brazen act clearly suggests a very misplaced confidence that, don't worry, in a few months at least, will result in their capture. But I'm telling you right now, this didn't do it. I have to He go. had a police officer hand a woman to him. Like? Who he murdered that night and brought back to Dr. Knox and was paid for it. That is beyond. And they did not get caught. And also the fact that it took months for them to get, like, if... And, it, and it's sad because, again, it's they are taking advantage of who they believe to be, quote unquote, less dead. Yeah. And they're just proving that stigma, you yeah. know, by like t you literally take your victim from a police officer and yeah. the police don't even realize that this woman is who she is and that she got killed. Exactly. That's and that, so fucked. And that this police officer doesn't care. Like no. just handed her over. And that was it. I don't need so to know sad. what happened to her after that. It's so sad. It's so sad. And it really is such a misplaced confidence, though, because he's out here being like, oh, yeah, like, I look at what I did. Right. I convinced a police officer to give it to me. That, as as horrible as the situation is, that is going to be the thing that takes them down, is them thinking that this is yeah. who they are now. They're right. able to have police officers just hand them victims. They're above the law. So that is going to be an issue for them late, later, but it was too little too late. Whenever you get, whenever you're, I feel like a murderer starts to get that kind of confidence, yep. it go. it's like a tailspin. It's hubris. Is that how you say that? Yeah. Tailspin? Yeah. yeah. Ash it's, can't say anything, but <laughs> she can say tailspin. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, and so in the late summer, Burke and McDougal, Helen, his wife, moved to, from Tanner's Close, the boarding house, to a small cottage not far from the boarding house. Okay. There, they shared this They shared this little cottage with a couple called the Brogans. I like that name. I do too. It's like very, I don't know why, it's like cozy. Uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just here with the Brogans. I would call them the Brogies. The Brogies. I would just call them the Brogues. I'm with my Brogies. I'm just here with my Brogans. <laughs> so some have suggested that the move was Burke's attempt to keep McDougal safe because of what you were saying after Hare and Laird had suggested that they um, murder her yeah. to keep her quiet. He might have felt like he had to put a little distance between Hare and his wife, which I'm like, you probably should stop murdering people with that guy, too. Seriously. Like, I don't know. Well, and also, I bet it was that, and then I bet what added on to it was the fact that he committed a murder like, without, without him. him. Yeah, and, and kept then the money. lied about it. Yeah. But it was at this house that Burke and Hare met their next victim. No. A washerwoman by the name of Mrs. Hostler. So one afternoon, the woman had just finished her washing for the day, and Burke and Hare convinced her to return the following day to have a few drinks with them. They were very charming. They were able to convince a lot of people to do this. Sounds like it. And she did. 
So the next day, after she'd become drunk, they convinced her to lie down in an adjacent room where they killed her by suffocation. So So this is what they did. They get their people drunk, and then they do it. And they're people who they know are desperate. They know are on hard times. They know are going to say yes to a lot of drinks just to numb whatever is happening in their lives. And I feel like it is. And I feel like it's also so important to say, like, how long it actually takes to suffocate someone. Oh, yeah. Like, they weren't – this wasn't, like, a quote-unquote easy way to get away with it or, like, an easy way to do it. Like, these people are fucking monsters. You have to stand there for, like, what is it? Isn't it, like, seven minutes or something? It's very, like, for strangling. It's it's definitely – and for suffocation, too, it's – It's probably similar. It's brutal. Yeah. And it's aggressive. It's violent. It's aggressive. Like, nobody's laying there motionless. They're laying there fighting for their lives trying to breathe. Exactly. It's awful. So fucked. And, like, it, for that to – for you to stand over somebody for a, ma- a matter of minutes and do that, yep. like, you are You got to be shut down. Seriously. Like, there's got to be just nothing. nothing there. It's just a cold, empty box in there. It's so crazy. Well, then they just loaded her body into a box. They stored that box in the coal house until later that afternoon. And then they transported her to Dr. Knox. And she – she um they got eight shillings for her body. Oh, Okay. Not a full ten. So like all over the place. Knox yeah, he's is. just he's just making random assessments right. of price here. Make an assessment. So not I thought of that same thing. Make an assessment. Not long after the murder of Hostler, Burke, and or excuse me, not <laughs> I don't know why I just said that all in one sentence. Don't you hate when you go to read a yes. sentence that you wrote and you're like how do I speak? <laughs> How did I How mean do I to read say again? that out loud? Well, sometimes when you type something, it sounds different in your head than the way you say it out loud. That's it. They or I forget a punctuation mark, and then oh. my brain just runs everything together. I'm a punctuation that's what here. monster. I like over punctuate yeah. everything. See, that's what happened here, and then my brain's like, no comma, just keep going. Who gives a fuck about it? But Oxford what I comma. meant was, not long after the murder of Hostler, Burke and McDougal welcomed into their home and McDougal. Same last name. Yes, it's a cousin of Helen's. Bitch. Um, it was actually a cousin of Helen's previous husband, so like technically. Cousin in law. Yeah. That's a cousin, though. Drew's cousins are my Still cousins. A cousin. I love them. Still a cousin. One afternoon, while the Brogans, the other couple that they were living with, were out of the house, Burke and Hare murdered Anna McDougal. They murdered his wife's cousin. cousin. Yep. What? And it the was with fuck? Hare doing most of the work, of course. Burke was not the one who did most of the work. So what? clearly Hare is trying to like put some some kind of message out there. Yeah, like a certain Like he's getting dominance. closer to her. Like oh my I'm, God. And it's like Burke is allowing it. That made my stomach and going flip, along actually. With it. Yeah. Because he's like, I, I'm killing your family members now. Oh my God, he is. They're both fucked, but like that's yeah. another level. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm just, I can't. And because of this whole like, oh, um, it's a relative thing. Yeah. Burke said that he did not like to begin first on her because she was a relative. Oh, of Helen. totally, yeah. totally. So don't totally. worry about that. What did, was the wife like? Hey, what happened to my fucking cousin? Yeah, <laughs> she was like, "What's going on here?" But they loaded her body into a trunk and they intended to take her body to Knox. But before they had the chance, the Brogans came home, Ooh. and knowing that no one in the house owned a trunk, they um. Started asking several questions as to the origin of this trunk that was now sitting in their house. I'm going to admit something to you. I thought they put her in the trunk of a car because I forgot that we were like way back. We were way back. I was like, nobody owned a trunk. No one owned it. You're like, oh, oh, and like a steamer trunk. trunk. Exactly. Got you, got you. Uh, When it became clear the couple was not going to stop asking these questions, Burke and Hare. (laughs) Hey, where'd this fucking (laughs) trunk come from and what's in it? Like they were literally like, hey, where did this trunk come from? And they're like, don't worry about it. And then like they're also like, don't open it. They like walk in the other room and put their coats up and they're like. But about that trunk, like, do you have any information? And they're like, no, we don't. And then they're like, okay, cool. Can we open it um, and, like, see? Can we, like, open the trunk and maybe just see what's inside? No, we can't. Well, okay. maybe there's, like, a name inside. Do you guys want dinner? Yeah, we would love dinner. Do you want to, like, should we ask the trunk if it wants to be part of dinner? <laughs> like, what? They just don't work and let the trunk go. I don't blame them. I'm not going to let yeah. a random appearing trunk in my home no, go. I'm not. And Burke and Hare eventually, for the record, (laughs) sorry, uh, Burke and Hare eventually sat down with the Brogans, excuse me, Mr. Brogan, and explained the entire situation to him. They said, hey, it's just like times are tough and we like to make extra money by murder. And what do you think? And then they said, hey, do you want to be in on this and get some of the money? 
if you don't say anything? And he was like, okay. And he meant it? Yep. And he meant it. Um, he said, okay. I thought you were going to say he meant it and then he no. um, motioned for the police. He said. I know you can't call them back then. He said, yeah, that's fine with me. Wow. Yep. How does horse shit find horse shit that then finds some more horse shit? What's crazy, too, is that with each murder committed in this particular period, they're just growing increasingly reckless, first of mm-hmm. all. And they're also pulling apart from each other drastically yeah they're doing things on their own they're not listening they're killing each other's relatives at this point like shit's going down now they're inviting other people into this whole scheme like bitch the more people you have in this scheme the more shit is going to fall apart it's not the merrier no it is not the merrier they're also splitting that profit in way more pieces which is way less advantageous to them with they're murdering people yeah and now you're splitting the profits like now they're splitting it four ways. But are least. they not because Laird's, this one didn't take place in Laird's boarding home? I think because I she is like part that. of it, she gets that one shilling just for her silence. Oh, I see. That's I see. how he's Hush able money. to hold all these people. They are able to hold all these people. And that's why McDougal is such a liability to okay. them because she's not getting anything for it. Got she's it. not getting anything for her silence. Yep. And they're not just going to pay her. Unless she has something to do with it because you need her hand to have blood on it. So yep. you can go, she did it too. Yep. That way she's not going to be eager to go to the authorities because then she has to admit that she's been part of it. Okay. So they're not getting that from her. This is nutso. So that brings us to the beginning of the end. Oh. So for I obvious reasons end. and with very few exceptions, Burke and Hare killed mainly elderly and incapacitated And transient, like, down-on-their-luck women. Yeah. That seems to be their MO. Oh, they go go away from it. That Well, although they were almost always opportunists, like, they were always just, they weren't, like, following people and, like, trolling for days, you know what I mean? Their preferred victim type, type likely had something to do with the fact that women were just much easier to overpower in their mind. Mm -hmm. Um, And that... But what's wild is, like, at least one of them, and probably more of them, there was evidence that they tried to fight back yeah. and resist. And this became very evident in the in this whole thing that, like, they were definitely doing this because they could overpower their victims. Yeah. It became evident that they thought this was the case and that it wasn't in October uh, when they murdered James Wilson, who was otherwise known as Daft Jamie. What does, like, Daft mean again? So I, I'll explain to you. According to George McGregor Wilson, he was described as, quote, a lad who, while deficient in intellect, was kind at heart. Don't you dare. He was ruin a me universal right favorite. Stop. Uh, among the townspeople, he was. Now, Jamie's had a very kind nature. He was not confrontational. He was not an aggressive man. Oh. It. People loved him. He was, like, very beloved. But he also was kind of, like, a frequent target of bullies. Fuck that. They would just, like, taunt him and shit. And in his early 20s, by the time of this happening, Jamie's father had died many years earlier, and and his mother was a hawker who was often traveling, selling goods. So he spent a lot of his time just wandering the streets in Edinburgh. If Jamie doesn't live, I'm leaving. (laughs) So, as a result of this, he became a very familiar figure to people around town. Yeah. Especially to the people who would, just out of the kindness of their heart, give him food and gifts. Take because he was or... just a nice kid. Oh, I And he's in his him. 20s at this point, but I, I say kid, but that's a kid too. Yeah, that's a kid, yeah. Um, and they kind of, like, looked after him in a way, because, like, they just knew he was, like, you know, he needed it. See, there is some kind of community here. Yeah, there I is. Was, I was looking for it. There is. Now... Jamie Wilson was definitely not only the antithesis of a typical Burke and Hare victim because he was not a drinker. He was not a woman. Right. He was not. He was pretty strong. He's not an older person. He's not older. And he's well known to everybody in town. Mm -hmm. Very well known. Like this is like front page of Time Magazine kind of well known. Like even more so than the Very more so. Yeah. So this is just like totally the antithesis of their typical victim. He was also... The stupidest choice for a victim. Because, 
like I said, he didn't drink. You're not going to ply him away with alcohol. Yeah. So what the fuck is your move? And then you're going to have to overpower him while he's sober. He can fight you. He's he's not going to be easily lured easily lured away. And when he is suddenly gone, everyone's going to notice immediately. Yeah, he's like everyone's kid. You're not going to be able to bring him to Dr. Knox and have it be like, oh, yeah, it's just weird. Daff Jamie just dropped in. It's like, no, no one's going to believe that. Now, it was actually Margaret Laird who'd chosen Jamie as a victim because she discovered him alone and looking for his mother at a grass market one day in early October. Fuck you, Margaret. Yep. Fuck That's what I you. said. Now, according to Burke, Jamie agreed to accompany her back to the boarding house, but he was very anxious the entire walk back to the house and kept asking questions. Oh, my God, you're ruining me. When they reached the house, Laird left Jamie with hair while she went to find Burke whom she eventually found at a local shop, and the two of them went back to Tanner's Close, the boarding house. Back at the house, Laird left the three men alone, which they offered Jamie some drinks, and after a, after a little while, and Jamie did drink with them, Yeah, he became a little tired and laid down at the bed, and that's the point where Hare laid next to him. No. A few minutes passed before Hare threw himself on top of Jamie and attempted to cover his mouth and nose. But it didn't the work. The same thing. It didn't work. Jamie, however, yeah. was neither drunk or incapacitated at this point. So he started struggling and resisting, and the two men fell from the bed and yeah, continued to struggle on the floor. Eventually, though, Burke was able to get a hold of Jamie's feet and legs, which he held tight as Hare suffocated Jamie. No. So he, like, they almost lost this one, and this was the stupidest. Thank goodness they were so stupid, but this is so tragic. I'm, like, so— They're all tragic, but this one's just, like— Yeah, Are no, you of course. fucking kidding me? Like, and, and like, like, Margaret, go fuck yourself. Like he's looking for his mom, and that's when you fucking pray And he's clearly, him. like— Yeah. Like, intellectually a little immature. Yeah. And it's, like— He's looking for his mother, and he's, like, in his early 20s. Like, come on, That's man. That is fucking disgusting. It's vile. I, it's like, really I'm vile. I'm so angry right now. It's, ugh. And, oh, so, I had hope. I know. I feel I felt bad building you up like that, but I was like, I don't know how else well, to say Well, that's how this. you tell the story. Yeah. Now, in nearly every, uh, every case, Burke and Hare were very careful to get rid of their victim's clothing and whatever possession the victim had on them at the time. So if they would they just had be like, anything. I found them naked. Essentially, they just bring the body to wow. Dr. Knox. Um, and in this case, though, their victim had a lot of belongings. Most of the time, their victim didn't have a lot of things on them because they didn't have a lot of things in the world. Was he walking around with like, a lot like, of those things? He had a lot of belongings and he had some things of value because he was, he was you know, which they ended up just splitting between them. Yeah, they just figured. stole all the things. And eventually they gave his clothing to Burke's brother, who passed them on to his younger children. And he knew? Yep. Fuck this. Yep. So, and this is the thing. So his brother didn't know. But, like, they they knew that he was going to oh. be, they knew that Constantine was going to give these clothing, this, these clothes to his children. Yeah, that's And they still allowed gross. it to happen. Yeah, because they have actually no souls. Yeah, because Constantine Burke and the children didn't recognize the clothing. So they were no. just like, okay. They did eventually end up t- uh, trading them for, like, other items in mm-hmm. town, but still. So putting Jamie's... Very recognizable clothing and belongings out in the public because they were selling these goods now, too. Right. That was a really bad idea. Because it's not like you just like sold them to like some random person. You literally gave them to people in town that are connected to you. Exactly. And then you sold the belongings he had to people in town who are like, Oh, I, wait, I know what this is. And oh, I got that from Burke. Oh, I got that from Hare or Laird. Exactly. So the more significant problem was that the boy would almost certainly be recognized by Dr. Knox. Right. That was the biggest problem. Like, when you bring this kid in, they're going to know exactly who he is. So, indeed, when it was brought to him, he wasn't home. But when they arrived with the body, his assistant didn't really look very quickly. Okay. So he just was like, okay. And he was like, you know what? Can you return the next day? And, you know, Knox will be here and he'll pay you. So the next day when they did inspect the body, several of Knox's students were like, that's Jamie. Oh. And they were like, what the fuck? But Knox was like, you know what? Ready the body for dissection. So he 
100% recognize this body, just like, but he was like, just ready for it for dissection. What the actual and, fuck? And like, then he assured his students this ever so fresh male subject could not possibly be anyone they knew. What? Yeah. Like, you really need to dissect that bad? You've had, how many bodies have we had up to this point? 15? Yeah. Like, I th- I think you've learned some some stuff. Or Maybe I think we 14 at this point. Take a second. Yeah. The fuck? And later, stu- these students were interviewed by police later, oh, yeah. obviously, because they were very much... They like, were like unwillingly involved in this. Exactly. They all told investigators they were pretty certain this was Jamie, but they didn't want to swear on it because they were Knox had told them that it wasn't. Well, and then they're obviously they're being intimidated by somebody who yeah. has power. So they're like, oh, and can I don't determine know. their future. Exactly. So the final murder occurred on October 31st. Uh, oh. Yeah. Did they do that like on purpose? I don't know. This is when Burke met Mary Doherty. And it was in a Rhymer's grocery store that morning on October 31st. So like the grandmother the pair had brutally murdered earlier that summer, Doherty had come from out of town in search of her son. Oh. And was virtually unknown to anyone in Edinburgh. Oh, no. So Burke struck up a conversation with this older woman, telling her that he'd also come to Edinburgh. He was from Ireland. And, you know, wow, crazy. My mom's maiden name is Doherty. So maybe we're related. Probably not. So in what she likely took as a friendly yeah. gesture, Burke invited her back to the home for breakfast with he and his wife. And she was like, great, absolutely, I'm friends. excited to make a friend, exactly. Maybe they can help me find my son, right. that kind of thing. So once they were in the house, Helen McDougal tended to this new guest mm-hmm. while Burke went off in search of hair. Okay. When he'd finally found hair, they went back to Burke's house where they found Helen and the guests cleaning up after breakfast. Well, it would have been pretty easy for them to overpower and murder Mrs. Doherty because she was very frail. Sure. Uh, The real issue that they were facing was getting rid of the couple who had been staying with Burke and McDougal for over a week. They were there was another couple in the house, and they must have seen her come in and eat breakfast. Exactly. So they were like, "Fuck." So they're just trying to think quickly here, and Burke told this couple that he'd run into an old family friend, and he wondered if it would be you know, terribly inconvenient for them to maybe find another place to stay for a night or two just so they could have this Mrs. Doherty, this family friend. He even went as far as suggesting they could stay with Hare and Laird for a few days. And the couple said, sure. Uh Uh-huh. So that evening, things went about the usual way. They had, so the couples had dinner with Mary Doherty, Burke and Hare and Laird. and They shared like multiple meals with oh, this yeah. woman. Like really got to know her. Wow. Probably heard all about her life. All about her missing yep. son. They had dinner with her at Burke and McDougal's home. Uh, afterwards, they sang, they danced, they drank, had a great time they with They literally her. like had a yeah. little party. It's, ugh, I just can't even. But they, whatever the case was, whether this was a planned ruse that way or if they just really got into it that night and were like enjoyed her company and Mm -hmm. still decided to go through it, around 10 or 11 that night, they, um, it it became a little loud and disruptive though, because they were getting, that's in like happy, loud and disruptive, not fighting. Yeah, they were like having fun. Dancing, drinking, singing. And it was drawing attention of neighbors. So people wanted to know what was going on. So a woman from the house next door went to look through the window and she saw what she later told police was Helen McDougal, quote, holding a bottle to the mouth of Doherty, pouring the whiskey down her throat. I always knew that I saw Helen McDougal for exactly who the fuck she was. Later that evening, the disruption continued when Burke and Hare got into an actual argument, a violent one. And it, they only stopped when Mary Doherty fell from her stool and crashed onto the floor. Oh, no, Mary. And she couldn't get up. So Laird and McDougal, the two women, used the opportunity to get out of the house, which is when Burke and Hare used the same method that they always used to suffocate Mrs. Doherty. But they did do something a little different with her, which I don't know if this was them trying something different that they were going to employ from here on out or if this was just i don't know okay but whichever man was doing the actual suffocating at some point they had used their hand to strangle mrs doherty around the throat and this left deep bruises on her neck now 
She was dead. They stripped her of her belongings, and Burke sent for Knox's assistant, and they explained that they just had another body to sell. Wow, crazy. It's, I can't. Now, with this, also, so they make the call. They're like, hey, you need to pick up this body tomorrow. And then they just went about the party. Drinking, dancing until the early hours of the morning. With a dead body and that they just murdered brutally. They had just exactly. Yep. Wow. So the following day, November 1st, Burke went to the boarding house to check on the um, on the lodgers that had been sent to the house. Right. And invite them back home for breakfast. Saying that, you know, their family friend, that old woman that they had met yesterday, she had grown very impudent, perhaps having taken too much liquor, and they found it next necessary to put her out. Mm-hmm. That's how they yeah. wanted to put it. Put her out. Yeah. So one of these lodgers, Mrs. Gray, thought that Burke was behaving a little strangely. Mm. And she said he was very nervously watching her and calling after her when she began cleaning around a pile of straw near the corner of the room. Burke kept up his weird, like, anxious behavior for most of the morning. And when several several of the occupants of the house needed to go out that afternoon... Burke actually instructed Mr. Mr. Brogan, who knows about all this stuff now, to sit in a chair by the bed in the corner and not move until he returned. Okay, Blair Witch, what the fuck? So he did. He sat in the chair. He didn't ask questions at first. And then when Burke left the house, he waited until he was out of sight. Because remember, this guy just joined this whole thing. He he just wanted money. Yeah. He he just, wasn't, he's yeah. not going to save your ass. So Burke's Still out of a sight. bad person. So, and, and also, he doesn't give a shit. Like, right. this is not a good guy. This is somebody who just doesn't give a shit. Exactly. So when he tells him, you got to sit by this corner of the bed near the straw in the corner, he's like, sure, sure, sure. So he sits there. Burke leaves. Once he's out of his sight, Brogan just leaves the house. Okay. Like, he didn't, he was like, I'm not doing that. Yeah, like, fuck off. So he left the house. And then Mrs. Gray, the lodger who thought that he was acting very strange, Dumbled. she's now alone in the house. Yeah. And she takes this opportunity to investigate. Yes, bitch, Whatever it was it. by the bed that Burke was definitely trying to hide and was definitely trying to have, like, guarded by Mr. Brogan. So she starts poking around the straw pile oh, in the bed, next to the bed, excuse me, and she found the nude body of Mary Doherty. Can blood you imagine? all around her mouth and nose. Why did she have blood around her mouth and Because she had been violently strangled. And oh probably, I'm assuming, should they might have, like, hit her or something. Oh, my God. Something bad happened there. And she also had fallen from her stool. Right. I, I don't know if she that. had any, like, traumatic mm-hmm. fall there. So she literally finds this naked old woman who was clearly murdered in a pile of straw in the corner of their bedroom. Wow. So she knows why she was sent out the night yep. before. So she immediately tells her husband. She's like, we gotta get the fuck out of here. And the two of them start gathering up all their belongings. And they're like, we're getting the fuck out of here. But then. So Mrs. Gray is packing and Mr. Gray started carrying things downstairs. And as this is happening, he ran into Helen McDougal. I knew one of those fuckers was lurking. And when he ran into Helen McDougal, he demanded that she explain what the fuck was going on. Like, he was like, you tell me why the fuck there's a body in that bedroom. Yeah. Like, you tell me. And at first, she tried to just, like, dismiss the question. Yeah, because she's a little butthead. But she kept, but he kept pushing. He was like, no, you can't, you literally can't dismiss a body in your bedroom. Like, you need to explain that. A naked old woman's body in your bedroom. Like, tell me what that's about. The fuck? And so she finally broke down and said, I suppose you know very well what it is. Uh, I don't, though. And then she begged Mr. Gray not to say anything and then offered him several shillings in exchange for silence. And then he to- then Helen told Mr. Gray that Doherty had died that night from an overdose of drink. Yeah, right, bitch. Why well, is her mouth all bloody? But she he did not believe her. Of course not. He was not. like, no. And then she decided to switch her tactics you remember innocent mcdougall over here remember no, everybody i don't remember because i always had her number poor innocent helen no. she had nothing to do with this fuck helen she decided to change her tactics when mr gray wasn't gonna believe the she overdosed on drinks so we stripped her naked and tied her in a pile of straw yeah so she was like okay and she started convincing trying to convince him to join in on the scheme He's like, yeah, I have a conscience, though. That's the only problem. Helen's also an actual piece of shit. All four of these assholes are pieces of shit. I knew it. I knew she had, there was too much going on for her not to know about. And the fact that she went along with it and didn't get paid is like wild. Yeah, it truly is. That says even more. Yeah. 
Truly. Like, I'm not saying, like, well, sure, they were getting paid, so that's why they did it. But it's like, no. wow, you weren't even in on this. Yeah, you weren't even, like, what the hell was going on in and your you head? you were still cool with it. Yep. And so she couldn't convince anything to, she couldn't convince them to join the scheme. She wasn't getting a promise of silence from them. So she followed them into town. Oh, shit. And they ran into Laird in town. Oh, I'm so nervous. Somehow, the Greys, the Greys agreed to join Laird and McDougal at a nearby public house for, like, a drink. What? And the women continued to try to convince them to stay quiet. They bought them rounds of drinks. They used every argument they could to try to convince them that this was something that was fine, ethically. Y'all, don't drink a drink that they buy you. What's good is they were very unpersuasive. The Greys got a bunch of free drinks out of the deal. There you go. And they left the bar that afternoon and went straight to the police. <laughs> love that. I love that they're like, you know what? Yeah, we could <laughs> you can use buy a me few some drinks first. Yeah. Uh, but when they went to the police, they were made to wait several hours for someone to even listen to their story. Oh, good. Yeah. That checks. So when Mr. Gray was finally able to tell his story to a police sergeant, the officer said that Gray was simply a disgruntled tenant looking to cause problems for his landlords. I'd be like, do you want to, like, maybe go talk to uh, anyone about this, though? So that's what he was like. Do you want to... Um do you want to come back to the house and like check and see and if maybe the body's still come there? see this corpse in the corner of a room? Do you want to do that? So they were like, yeah, totally. So they he went with Mr. Gray to the home of Burke and McDougal. The body and was Burke gone. confirmed the sergeant's theory, saying that the Grays were former tenants and that he'd had to turn them out for bad conduct. Oh, please. So Burke was like, yeah, you're right. Like they're just they shitty. just suck. They're just shitty tenants. But then the officer did a little search of the home. And there he found spatters of blood on the bed sheets yep. and the floor. And like, and this was all where she had been killed before being brought to Knox. Yeah. And it all matched up with what Gray had told the police. Right. It was the same room. It was this, the spatters made sense for what had happened. So when asked, Burke and McDougal gave very inconsistent stories about who the woman was, when she left. And this alone was enough for the police to be like, you two need to come in and we're going to question you, you further. Think? Because they were like, you can't agree who she was or when she even left. And like, are why you kidding she's me? in your house? Like, so, she's literally in your fucking yeah. house. So Burke and McDougal were taken down to the police station for questioning. The okay. next day, officers went back to Burke's home to do a more thorough search, and they found more blood stains, and they also found Mary Doherty's blood-stained clothing. <gasps> Meanwhile, additional officers... Um, they also brought a police surgeon, Dr. Black. They all went to Dr. Knox's address where they discovered Doc Dockery's body, bleh, body sorry. <laughs> yeah. Dockery's body being readied for dissection. Oh my. Yeah. So they had the bloody clothing and the body now in their possession. And Holy so shit. now more officers were sent to Hare and Laird's boarding house. Where they were informed, where they informed Margaret Laird that Captain Stewart wished to see her husband. So as um, as they had done with the Greys, Laird tried to just dismiss the whole thing. The whole evening is events are being misunderstood here. She overdosed. We didn't do anything. It was just drunken revelry. What? But she was very unsuccessful, just as they were. And both Hare and Laird were taken into custody as well. And Burke and McDougal now were officially arrested after being questioned. Hare and Laird are just being brought in for questioning. So throughout the fall of 1828, Burke and Hare made tons of reckless and very risky decisions. In the beginning, they were doing things pretty undercover. Mm -hmm. They got so fucking reckless. It at unraveled. The end. Like it's really wild to watch. It's a it's a true downfall for them. But they were so fucking brazen mm. and so weirdly confident that they could get away from this. It is crazy how confident they were. That's the thing. Like, Burke was even trying to explain away that why Doherty was in his house. Like, <laughs> why her body was in his house. And like, that it's just wild. goes to show how fucking, like, delusional they were or, like, yeah. like confident. It's like, what? Like, you really thought that was going to make sense or oh, that was wait, really going to work? Wait until you hear the story he tells. Oh, you want to hear the – because he told one story and now this is the other story he tells. Okay. It's – so his first formal explanation for why Doherty's body was in his home, according to Burke, he and McDougal had begun their day like any other day. With murder. Any other day. And suddenly a man approaches him – looking to have some shoes mended. He's a cobbler, after all. Oh my, I literally forgot that. Yeah, Burke had never seen the man. He didn't remember his name. He couldn't tell you anything about him. 
but he agreed to help him out and he took his shoes and began to work. And while this stranger is, while he's working on this stranger's shoes, this stranger just drags a trunk into his house while he's working on his shoes. This can't be and real. He's, and he's working. He's, he's just working. And he's like, I don't know why you have that crazy trunk in here, but that's fine. And Burke said, it's so weird. I could hear the man removing the ropes that were used to secure the trunk. And then I found, I, I, you know, I, I heard this sound of a man like, burying something under a pile of straw, I think it was. Like, that's the sound that I heard. No, I must go. And I think that pile of straw was next to the bed. Yeah, it sounded like that. I, I've left. And he said, and then that man left. Me and too. And then I discovered what that man had left in my house, and I tracked him down, and I demanded that he come back and he remove this body. And this guy said, sure, I will, but I can't come back until tomorrow morning to do it. And he said... Okay, my guy, I guess. Okay, my guy. He said, all right, I guess I'll go back and just live with this naked dead body in a pile of straw in the corner of my bedroom for tonight. As one does. And then you come back and you take this out. And I didn't know him at all, but I just figured he was good on his word. Yeah, you know, he he seemed like a trustworthy guy. This murderer, he just seemed, you know, like... This stranger... With a dead body. literally approached me in town. I don't remember his name or his face. Couldn't tell you a damn thing about him. He asked me to cobble a fucking shoe. I said, sure, why not? He came back to my house with me. He drags a trunk in my house. I hear him burying a body. I find said body, find him in town and say, hey, you better come get that body out of my house. And he says, I'll do it tomorrow morning. And you say, I I believe you. I believe you, you, sir. I think you will come back. I think you will come back and get this body. I'm shook. And he said this. Two investigators, like, they were not going to be like, are you fucking shitting me? Are you shitting my dick, Burke? Are you really saying this story to me? A seasoned fucking investigator. And I'm going to go, wow, that what bad luck. Did they even What shitty luck Burke has. Did they even give him an answer? Were they even, did they, were they just like, you know what? We have to go now. Um, You're going to jail. Bye. Oh, yeah. And then, well, because I'm I'm sure it was one of those things where he went through that whole thing and they all just stared at him and you could hear the blink, 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 blink. Because then he was like, yeah, and you know, it's crazy. I met that woman earlier in the day. Because 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 he he couldn't. This stop. isn't absurd enough. We have to we have to add on to it. He goes, yeah, she was begging for money, and he said, out of the kindness of my heart, I invited her back to my house for a meal and for some drinks, and she returned to town after that. After I had fed her, after I had oh, so she given her alcohol, house. she left my house and she went back into town. And I said goodbye. <laughs> I, I hope you goodbye. have a great night. I hope that I have fed you well. I hope I hope I have done. I, I, I hope I have done what I'm. the teachings have told me to do, to feed you, to bring you in. And I send you back out to town. And he goes, I never saw her again. Until she I never was back saw her in my again. house. Until that man left her dead body in my house. Like, what a coincidence. And he says, a day or two later, the stranger sent two men w- who Burke had never met before oh, to retrieve the body. Now. And he goes, one of those men who I had never seen before came to my house and his name was William Hare. So now he is claiming that this stranger that dragged a trunk into his house that contained a dead woman who he had met earlier that day, brought to his house to feed and give drink because he was just so kind, sent back into fucking town to be murdered by this stranger that dragged her in a trunk in his house and hid her in a pile of straw in the corner of his bedroom. He claims that he went back into town, found this man, said, you need to come get this body out of my house. This man said, I'll come back later. This man said, I'm sending two of my guys to come get this lady. And he said, sure. These guys show up at his house and he says, never saw him before, just two strangers to me. But one of them was William Hare. Like, motherfucker, you've been seen around town. I could ask, like, Joe Schmo from down the street, like, hey, you know Burke and Hare? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, those fuckers. I'm shook. Like, you're well known in town. You Not only are you friends, your wives are friends. You have, the, you're, a, you're a squad of four. Yeah. Like, yep. what? Yep. And, like, like, ah! it's unbelievable. It's unhinged <laughs> that, behavior. And this is, fucking ridiculous it's incredible that he told this story thinking it was gonna do anything but make everybody go what but you you know why he every part of the story makes sense for why he put it in there 
as absurd as it is, he was trying to explain, one, why people, because he knew he had been seen everywhere. He had been seen with this woman. He had been seen with, Bur- he had been seen with hair. He had been seen everywhere. So he's, <laughs> he's doing this to say why people had seen him yep. with Mary Doherty, both in town and at his home, because yep. neighbors had seen her in his home. Two, why her body and traces of blood were found in his house. He's explaining that away. Of course. Why the body had been by, seen by Gray at the house, but, the, but, but then when the officers came back later that day, it yep. was gone. Yep. He's saying, well, those two men came and took her away. So that's what I have to tell you. And it's also to say why Hare had been seen selling the body to Dr. Knox the next day, because he was one of those strange men who came and got that body. I have, like, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I have to go. Like, what? It's, it's absurd. It's ridiculous. And I'm like, wow, you really hit every, you tried to hit every possible thing that could connect you to this and explain every part of this, but in the stupidest way imaginable. Seriously. Like, really wild. And even more wild and unfortunate for him was that it didn't line up with fucking McDougal's fucking confession about it. Because they didn't talk about this. She's like, nah, me and my hubby are bros with them. Sorry we murdered. One of the main discrepancies between his version of events that he just told that wild yarn that he just spun oh my god i love when people call like a crazy this story was a yarn, yarn. yes the, the main difference and the main issue between issue. that yarn and the one that mcdougall's gonna tell is that she was like oh um yeah we spent the day um drinking with william Hare and his uh his lady margaret laird because we're they, and they're like, oh, like one of the guys who came to get the body that Burke didn't has never met and like, didn't know who he was. <laughs> you guys spent multiple, multiple, multiple months, if not years. Was it years that yeah, they spent killing? It's a, years I mean, that they months spent at the very least. It's like, and you didn't ever like. I'm happy that you didn't, but like, it's mind boggling to me yeah. that not once did you sit down and say, hey, like. If we do end up getting caught, we got this, this is what we'll say. Yeah. Hey, no. hey, Helen, hey, Laird, come on over. This is our story that we should stick to. Yeah. You fucking imbeciles. Yep. Like, what? Yep. What? Yep. It's wild. I have to Helen, go. I love thinking about Burke being like, and then these two men show up and they come to get the body. And I said, oh, my God, this stranger's in my house coming to get this body of this woman that I, out of the kindness of my heart, I fed and I sent into town. And then she was dragged in a trunk into my house. This is wild. These two strange men. And these two strange men, one of them is William Hare. It's wild. I've never met that man before in my life. I don't even know who he is. I don't know him. I don't know him, investigators. I do not know him. And then they're like, cool, thank you. And they go into the next room and they're like, hey, Helen, can you tell me what you're doing today? And she's like, oh, my God, absolutely. Totally. We were drinking all afternoon with William Hare with and his our lady, BFFs. Margaret Laird. And it's like, wow. You know, <laughs> people never cease to surprise me. Never. 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 Um, after uh, McDougal pr- pretty much gave up the ghosts there. After she shot a fucking <laughs> megalodon-sized <laughs> hole in that story. <laughs> like, the fuck? Ripped a hole the size of the ozone layer in that story. <laughs> I think that's healing. <laughs> oh, good for that. Yeah. Good for that good news. Hole. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we've job. closed it up a little. We're doing something right I don't know, now. electric cars, You right? know what? Positivity. Yeah. I like that. Look at the joy candle. Look at that. Look at that joy candle. Anyway. She's standing up straight. She's cute. Um, but after that, Burke was like, okay, yeah, I murdered her. Like, he was just like, he was literally like, He's uh, like, so sorry okay. that I um, took a creative writing class a few weeks yeah. ago and got confused with that he while was like, I was here. Yeah. But I did kill her. Because they just came over and were like, hey, uh, you drank with them We today. know that you're like real bro with William Hare. We like, know do that you wanna, you... Do you want to you wanna edit that that statement you gave? And that's all it took. He was like, yeah, I mar- I murdered Mary Doherty and um, several other people. That would with literally, like, from the sounds of how close these couples were, that would be like me saying, like, if John, like, walked yeah. into a room and the police were like, hey, do you know that man? I'd be like, never seen him before in my no, life. No, never seen him. And they're like, but you've referenced him on this podcast yeah. multiple times. And You're I like, think no, that literally might be your sister's husband. And I'm like, no, I've no, literally never seen so. him. Like, I don't know that man. I don't know her. He's a stranger. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know what? that person. It's truly wild. What? It's really, you can see now, like, they were just dumb. 
Just dumb, Stupid. angry guys. That's all. Dumb, angry guys. Yeah. So, so basically, the authorities in Edinburgh knew that in, able to, in, in order to get a conviction, they just had to get the four of them to turn on each other. Yeah, That's right. which was four of them. Seemingly easy. Yeah. And it might have been because of his younger age or because Doherty's body had been discovered in Burke's house. But Lord Advocate William Ray, William Ray, he determined that Hare would be the one most likely to turn on Burke. Okay. Because although what, like Hare, uh, Burke is agreeing that he knows Hare, he hasn't thrown him completely under the bus yet. Hare also just like gives me more diabolical vibes. Yeah, and Hare's going to turn on Burke, he's going to turn on McDougal, and they were like, he's going to turn on Laird. I'm yeah. not, I don't think he's got any kind of and loyalty Hare, to these people. Hare is the one that does the actual suffocating, right? Yeah, he may. He, I think he's the aggressor. Okay, for sure. They're but they both are. But I would, hair's just something about him. Yeah, something you're, about no, him. You're right. Just, it ma- it makes me a little scared. Or agreed. A little more scared of him. Agreed. I don't know why. Um, I I thought it was kind of funny that like Burke essentially like implicated hair already, but like go <laughs> off king. I guess like sure, hair's going to turn on Burke. Sure. But despite that, Ray's assumptions seem to have been pretty well placed because he offered Hare immunity in exchange for a full confession, and Hare happily accepted. <laughs> he said, glad that I got my neck out of the halter, and as for poor Bill Burke, well, he must go hang, I suppose. Oh, Sold his friend right up the river. Oh, God. And was like, guess he's got to hang. He never gave a shit about him. No, he didn't give a shit about anybody. I'm, I don't give a shit about either of them. Fuck and both of these losers. From the moment they were arrested and put in a jail cell, all four acu- of the accused were prevented from seeing or speaking to each other. They couldn't communicate at all until the trial. Good. And this makes it that it was probably a huge surprise to Burke that Hare had literally turned completely against him because he had no idea. He went into trial being like, and then it's like all of a sudden hair's like i'm the star witness it's right. like what like that must have been like excuse me when he probably especially didn't expect that because he was the one that really did more of exactly the, like so actual stuff like are you fucking kidding me so as um as lisa rosner pointed out when the warrants for arrest and incarceration were handed down burke and mcdougall probably had some idea that the lord advocate was being given information by either Laird or Hare. Like, the Lord Advocate. I know, isn't that like a wild... Like, okay, Scott Disick. Right? Step aside, Lord I'm the Advocate. Lord Advocate. Lord Advocate. Uh, like, so he, he probably had an idea that information was being given by yeah. Hare and Laird. Um, like, the first warrant for the murder of Mary Dougherty was sworn out against all four, and so was the second one, which was against Jam- was for the murder of James Wilson. And only after Hare's detailed confession... The warrant for Wilson's murder was amended and was only against Burke and McDougal. So Hare had no, 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 against it. The same happened for the warrant for the murder of Mary Patterson, which only named Burke and McDougal as the perpetrators in that one, too. Oh. So now Burke and McDougal are being. Wow. I did not see that coming. I didn't either. Damn. Now, like we said throughout this whole thing, it's very unclear t- the exact extent that Helen McDougal played in these murders. She obviously participated in some way, be it yeah. an outside side thing. You know, right. like she definitely had knowledge of what was happening. Yeah. There. Like definitely had it. But throughout the murder spree and confessions, William Burke went to great lengths to completely distance Helen from any of the schemes and to protect her from any prosecution. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, Burke probably felt even doubly betrayed when he learned that Hare hadn't just sold him out, but had also sold McDougal out. Right. Because throughout the entire thing, he had tried to protect her. And it's like now he made sure to, like, and that's the thing, you know Hare was just so fucking happy to be able to put McDougal in that. I mean, he literally wanted to kill her. Yeah. Now, over the centuries after this, Helen McDougal's name has kind of disappeared from the retelling of this story. Like, she's in there, but no one points to her as like, what the fuck were you doing? Yeah, exactly. I do. But at the time of Hare's confession, which they basically were, they were really going off of Hare's confession at this point. 
Um, he identified her as equally responsible for the crimes. Uh. And so Burke and McDougal were the only two prosecuted for the murders. Are you kidding me? Burke and McDougal were indicted December 8th, 1828 for the murders of Mary Dougherty, James Wilson, and Mary Patterson. Their trial began December 24th, and it went a full 24 hours. It was presided over— It went over, into Christmas? It went into Christmas. It was oh, pre- presided over by a panel of four justices— um, it began at 9 a.m., and from the moment the doors were opened, the courtroom was packed Yeah, because back then people. you could just, like, fucking find your way oh, into yeah. a courtroom. And they just wanted to see these ghouls. They had read a ton about them in the paper because there was tons of media surrounding this case. And after they read the indictments, both of the accused pleaded not guilty. Before the trial could begin, however, Burke's attorney or argued it was inappropriate for his client to be tried for three unconnected murders. And after a long discussion, the justices agreed with Burke's attorney Interesting. and ruled in favor of trying one case at a time. Okay. So they didn't want to try the three unconnected murders in one trial. So after they announced the decision, uh, Lord Advocate William Ray was given the opportunity to choose which charge he wanted to begin with, and he chose the murder of Dougherty because he figured it was the strongest case. Right. So the trial went on with several witnesses saying they had seen Dougherty with Burke throughout the day. Um, and also, because Blake, uh, excuse me, Burke had claimed the woman was a heavy drinker, at least one witness refuted that claim, uh-huh. telling the jury she, quote, never saw her worser for liquor. Oh. Um, f- and after, also, the prosecution laid out the evidence of the murder, including the body having been discovered by the Greys in Burke's house, mm-hmm. the blood stains on the clothing, the blood stains on the bedding, on the floor. The examination of the body showing very clear evidence of strangulation and that she did not die of an overdose. Yep. Um, The strength of the physical evidence was definitely bolstered by the Crown's key witness. Hare. William Hare. He testified that it was Burke who plotted with McDougal to kill Dougherty for money. And he said, quote, he had an old wife in the house and that it it was a shot for the doctor's. And he went, so Hare went a step further, telling the do, uh, the jury that Dougherty had left the house several times, but had been enticed to come back inside each time by none other than Helen McDougal. Ooh. So throughout the trial, Lord Advocate William Ray <laughs> and his assistant prosecutors were very, very deliberate and very measured in their questioning of Hare on the stand. Okay. They were very careful to avoid any kind of question that might incriminate him in any of the crimes. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. He did, however, admit on the stand that he had sold the body to Knox. Okay. But his participation in the murder of Dougherty was otherwise very minimal- minimized. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, his role in the actual murders, completely ignored. There were no witnesses called by the defense. They just completely ignored it. And after the evidence was given and closing statements were made, the jury deliberated. Um, it was a little after 8 a.m. on December 25th on Christmas. Oh, my God. I'm surprised by Took that. Took about an hour, and they returned a guilty verdict for Burke's participation in the murder of Mar- uh, Mary Dougherty, and he was sentenced to hang. Merry Christmas, motherfucker. The charge against Helen McDougal was found to be unfounded. Oh. Mm-hmm. So that's why you don't hear her name and her guilty ass in this story. What's even worse is it's 100% a certainty that Margaret Laird was involved in the whole scheme. She was paid. But she got no consequences. And what about hair? Yep. So it's so wild to me. While Burke did his best to shield Helen of consequences for for the crimes that they had committed, um, it was really the defense attorney, Henry Cockburn, who saved her from having to hang. I mean, yeah. Throughout the trial, he painted a picture of McDougal as a dutiful wife who lived with seeing many things which are better imagined than told. Basically saying she saw some shit, she knew what he would do to her, so she kept her kept mouth quiet. shut and she did what she was supposed what she was told to do. And It was true that she hadn't informed the police of Burke's crimes, but it was only because she, quote, felt obliged to make false statements in order to protect Burke and avoid basically becoming destitute. Yeah. like go. And in this time, especially, Mm -hmm. that is an argument. She didn't want to be thrown out on the streets because that was almost certain death eventually. Right. And so they were basically being like she feared for her own life, which doesn't give her, like that doesn't spare her from being a criminal. 
but it also is like a way to defend her in a yeah. court of law. Exactly. You know, like it makes it like I understand you the argument. It. Exactly. Um, it also helped her case immensely that there was no evidence and no testimony that could even slightly connect her to the murders. Right. Which she was found not guilty in the mm-hmm. end. Now, on the morning of January 25th, 1828, a crowd of nearly 25,000 people gathered in Lawn Market, which is a town square off High Street, and they watched William Burke hang in the gallows. Damn, so people were, like, abandoning their Christmas meals just yeah. to be like, let's go watch this man. Well, this was hung. January 25th. Oh, so this said was January, my yeah. bad, sorry. Maybe I did say December by accident. No, you probably said January. Um, so a month no, later. No, You said it right. You were right. <laughs> uh, a month later. Okay, okay. But... What's kind of ironic is uh, Burke's body was donated to the medical college the following day and was dissected by Professor Alexander Monroe, the doctor that they were looking for initially when they accidentally knocked on Dr. Knox's door. Yo. Isn't that wild? And he was dissected in front of an audience of nearly 20,000 people. Wow. Yep. And when he finished the dissection, Dr. Monroe apparently... He did this thing, and it's called an anatomist uh, ritual, okay. it was called, Love where that. he dipped his quill into the blood still contained in Burke's head and wrote the following declaration in blood. This is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh on 28th Jan- – oh, it was on the 28th. Excuse me. I got it wrong. That's okay. The 28th of January, 1829, for the murder of Mrs. Campbell or Dougherty. The blood was taken from his head on the 1st of February, 1829. They were Isn't on that some, spooky as fuck? They were on some wild shit back then. They really were. That's on, like, some opium thought process. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know what we should do? We should make a declaration. Dip a quill into his head. From the blood of his skull. Yeah. Like, and y'all were really God-fearing? I don't know about that. I mean, if you're worried about whether Helen McDougal just went on to live her life, I can help you not worry about that. I was. Uh, that was yeah. my next question after I got past also, the fact that they just like yeah. wrote a quick little post An it with his ritual. fucking blood. Uh, she was released from custody following the trial and she tried to go home. How'd that uh, work but She out? was met by a large group who'd assembled outside of her house and made it pretty clear that she better get the fuck out of Edinburgh or they were going to make sure that she didn't get out of there alive. Ooh. It's pretty assumed that she fled the city later, like very quickly after that. But um, no one knows what happened to her after that. Okay, she left Edinburgh. Hit me up with the deets on hair. People do think she was killed by an angry mob or that she changed her name completely and lived in like a, like isolated somewhere. Wow. Um, well, I will say the family of Jamie Wilson, yeah, the um, the young man who everyone literally knew and loved, loved, they protested against Hare's freedom, good, and aggressively petitioned the government to reconsider the immunity he was given in exchange for his testimony. I bet the Wilsons' petition was given very serious com- consideration, but the Crown ultimately decided that they were going to keep the immunity for his testimony, and Hare was very unfortunately released from custody on February fifth. Damn. But unfortunately for Hare, the public knew what he fucking did. Mm -hmm. And his very much equal participation in the murders, they knew about that too. It took less than a day for a mob to assemble outside the boarding house, intending to uh, kill him themselves. (laughs) For his own protection, he was taken into police custody where he was dressed and disguised and escorted out of the city via the road to Carlisle. Although he was never seen or heard from again, it's believed he either went to England or went back to Ireland and was never seen or heard you from again. You know that motherfucker murdered again. 100%. Because he got, he was the one he that, in my it. opinion, was way more diabolical. I think they were both fucked up and but diabolical. But something about hair. There was more to that. Something about him. Yeah, he got away with it. Holy shit. Yeah. That's crazy. They should look into some fucking unsolved they murders should. in England I know. or wherever he went. I actually want to look back and see if there's any connections later. There's got to be. And I'll, I'll let you know if we find anything. I don't think he just like was like, oh, well, all done. See you later. I'll just live a very quiet life after this. And what no, about his he wife? was probably bolstered. So she was released from custody in mid-January, and she left Edinburgh for, for Glasgow. And while she was in Glasgow, she was discovered by an angry mob and was re- had to be rescued by the authorities who put her and her baby, she had a baby at this point, oh, on a boat or not. and sent her to Ireland. Shit. Um, although, 
Although we don't talk about, like, when you read about this story, you don't hear a lot about what happened to Dr. Knox or his wrongdoing in all of this. Right. Um, he definitely claimed ignorance, for sure. But he was confronted by authorities, and they were like, you you definitely knew something was amiss here. You right. might not have known the details. But it's pretty hard to believe that he had no idea that this that they were possibly murdering people to supply him with bodies. Because mm-hmm. that last body had very clear evidence. Doherty had clear evidence of being strangled, and he turned his eyes the other he way. He also pretended like he didn't know that it was Jamie. But what's weird is Burke, when he confessed, went out of his way to clear Knox of any wrongdoing as well. He swore that Knox, quote, never encouraged, never taught, or encouraged him to murder any person. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't. I think he just turned a blind eye. And it's like, yeah, no one's saying, exactly, like, no one's saying that he told you to go murder people, but, like, he knew you were. He didn't tell you to stop murdering people. Exactly. And it's like, luckily, because he should definitely not be let off scot-free here, the public didn't forget his participation in everything either. Good. And after public outrage, he willingly resigned from his position. Bye, bitch. And Knox left Edinburgh several years later and resettled in London, where he died in 1882. Peace out, motherfucker. And that is the story of Burke and Hare. Girl, that's a wild tale. And you did like a really great job telling it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. That was, I was like... I'm and thanks like, to Dave for like Dave. diving deep in that one. I love Dave. I, we love Dave. Dave. <laughs> He's notorious. It's And you know what? We, we got to... We're working on another one that connects to this case. Oh my God. And I think Dave described it as like... A Hardy Boys, um, like a Hardy Boys book, but if there was serial killers in coffins. Yeah, that's exactly what he said, actually. <laughs> I, I was present for that combo. So it's going to be great. Guys. I'm intrigued. This story just is like fascinating to me, mainly because of the ending. One, how reckless and risky they get and brazen mm-hmm. and how they just fuck everything up from within. Yeah. Two, how hair, William Hare just... I don't know what it. it is about him, but I'm like, you, you're scary. Like, Burke is scary. But, like, hair, I'm like, something about you. And then the fact that he just gets away with it. Well, he, like, asserted dominance by, like, killing his cousin. He did. And was like, I also want to kill your wife. He was just, I don't know. And then know. he made sure that she had to go, she had to get named in those indictments. Like, yeah. that's some, like, power shit. And I, it's, like, scary. Mm-hmm. Like, those I feel like something moves. happened between him and McDougal. I like, know, right? There's I think some he made like an shit. advance that like she was like that get she the fuck away from me, yeah. And he was not about to deal yeah. with that. I mean, like I just like really like made a leap there, but I don't know. I don't know. I think. Well, I think there's a Buffy episode recently where it's like don't jump to conclusions, and it's like what I don't. I just took. I think she says like I just walked around the corner and their conclusions were. Yeah, exactly. I think this is the same situation. It's like. I don't think that's a leap. You just walked around a corner and their conclusions were. And with that being said, we were talking the other day. We're always like, oh my gosh, we should do like a chiller episode for a palate cleanser, which like we're still going to do. But if we ever do like an intense case and you need a palate cleanser, or if you don't and you just want to listen to another Mm -hmm. show, go listen to the rewatcher Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's so much fun. We're rewatching Buffy. Elena has seen it a million gazillion trillion times, but I never have. And in the last episode, they used a clip from Taken... Of Liam Neeson saying, I will find you and I will kill you. And you don't know what that's in reference to. And if that's and not you should go listen enough, and find out. <laughs> I don't know about you. They put fun clips in there and fun little sound things. And they it's put like, the, dun, 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 dun. it's so fun, guys. Like that, and that you, podcast gives us the most life. joy in the entire world. Life. It's just fun, silly nostalgia. Yeah, exactly. And if you don't know, now you know. Yeah, go listen to it. So with that being said, we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. But not as weird as hair. Definitely not as weird as Burke and hair ever or McDougal or Larry. But never, ever, ever keep it as weird as hair. Because I don't even know how weird that motherfucker kept it, but he kept it too weird. I can tell you that Yeah, much. he definitely kept it too weird. So like, bye. <laughs>